Okay, it's great. There are a lot of, for those of you who are online, uh, the, the lunchroom here is full of people. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, it's a, and spring is on its way. It's a great time. So it is my uh, extreme pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Bach. Uh, Elizabeth has a very interesting history and she has not taken your average normal academic path. So I thought several of you uh, students and postdocs would be interested in, in learning about, you know, other options for careers with a PhD in ecology. So Elizabeth got her bachelor's from Cornell College in Iowa. She then did a master's of science in plant biology at Southern Illinois University, where she worked with me. And I was extremely fortunate to have Elizabeth as a master's student with a lot of work and a couple of publications from that work. Then she went to Iowa State University to uh, do her PhD, working with Kristen Hochmachel. Um, from there, she went to the other survey, the Illinois Natural History Survey, for a two-year uh, postdoc. Um, and I don't know if you know this part of the story, Elizabeth, but I received an email from Diana Wall, who is one of the, the founding uh, people of soil ecology, who had emailed me and said, I have this, have this position. Do you know anybody? And I said, absolutely. And uh, so Elizabeth applied and uh, got the direct uh, position to be the executive director of the Global Soil Biodiversity Institute. Um, where she did a lot of work on global policy related to soil, and she is still involved in that work. Um, after that, uh, Natusa Grasslands, which is a nature conservancy site in Northern Illinois that is restoration oriented, um, established a scientist position, and Elizabeth, applied for that position and in her role, she works with a lot of land managers and volunteers and other scientists uh, to really catalyze the work that can go on there. And uh, I, I believe somebody here has a grant from, and if they, have, they offer grants to graduate students, oh, that would be Reb, uh, to graduate students. They're uh, competitive, and um, I think you played a large role in creating that opportunity. So um, we appreciate that. Her own research, um, again, is focused on soil ecology and plant ecology and plant and soil feedbacks. Um, through her role working at the Global Biodiversity uh, initiative. I'm not saying that right. Is that right? Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. In, initiative. In, initiative. Right. Okay. So she has a vast knowledge of, of soil biodiversity that um, will be fun for many of you to talk about. So today she's going to talk to us about long term data and outcomes from Nechusa grassland restoration. So thank you, Elizabeth. Well, thank you, Sarah, um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I, this is my first in-person talk uh, in two plus years, so um, it's really a joy to be here, to be with Sarah and her lab group, and to see some familiar faces who I've known at very interesting different places in my uh, career journey, so thank you for being here. I'm going to share my screen. for the folks online and here we go. All right, I'm gonna... All right so before I dive into uh, my work at uh, Nechusa Grasslands I'm gonna talk about today, um, I do wanna take a moment to thank um, some of the many people who have been uh, instrumental to me in this work and supporting me in this work. So first and foremost, my employers, the Nature Conservancy in Illinois. Um, this position that I hold was created. Um, they did the search in 2017. I came on board in 2018. So it's a new position. 
Um, and they've really been incredibly supportful and uh, given me latitude to really explore some new areas uh, with this position. My immediate colleagues at the Nechusa Grasslands Preserve are Bill Kleiman, Cody Considine, um, and Dee Hudson, who helps us out with some administrative work. Um, they're more involved on the management side of things, and I'm really trying to build a research program. I mentioned Dee Hudson and one of our esteemed volunteers, Charles Larry. They're both fantastic photographers. You're going to see a lot of their gorgeous images in this presentation, so I always want to give them a special shout out. Um, I also want to acknowledge some of the collaborating scientists who do research at Nuchisa Grasslands. Pete Gidden, uh, who's now an assistant professor at uh, Hamilton College in New York. Um, Holly D Jones, who's an uh, associate professor at Northern Illinois University. Nick Barber, who's an associate professor at San Diego State University. And Jen Chakraborty, who just uh, finished her master's degree at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, you'll hear parts of their data stories throughout this presentation as well. So where is Nechusa Grasslands? What is it? Uh, so we're a preserve located in Northern Illinois. We're by car about two hours west of the greater Chicago area, so rural Illinois. We're closer to uh, the Quad Cities on the Illinois-Iowa border than we are to Chicago. We're also about two hours south of Madison, Wisconsin. So that's where we are. And the Nechusa Grasslands Preserve began in 1986, um, when actually some local residents um, encouraged the Nature Conservancy to purchase and protect about, at that time, it was about 400 acres of land in this part of Illinois. And this included several hilltops that included remnant prairie that had never been broken or plowed. And that's incredibly rare in the state of Illinois. And a survey in the 1970s done by the Illinois Natural History Survey, the total acreage of remnant um, prairie in the state of Illinois was just over 2,000 acres for the whole state. So we don't have much of it. Uh, <coughs> The vision was to protect these remnant hilltops and to purchase some land between them. And the vision grew to restore the land between those hilltops and recreate, restore a landscape level tall grass prairie in Illinois, um, which just hasn't existed for a long time in that state. Today, the preserve we have just now uh, acquired, we're just now at 4,000 acres total uh, area. Most of this is restored. Most of this has been planted with seed collected by hand by volunteers and staff uh, painstakingly over 35 years. Uh, the preserve is home to over 700 native plant species, 250 bird species, 240 bee species, uh, which is mind blowing. Um, and we, in 2014, reintroduced a herd of bison. Um, and that herd is about 100 adult bison uh, who have access to about a third of the preserve now. Today, I'm going to tell you three data stories from Nechusa Grasslands. Um, the first is uh, one that I actually just recently published, looking at 20 years of plant community monitoring data collected across the site. Um, and most of this is data collected before I came on board, and I had the chance to um, analyze and synthesize that data. My second data story is going to focus on um, our monitoring efforts once, this bison, once the bison have been reestablished at Nechusa Grasslands. And so this is more recent data from the past five to six years uh, since the bison have been on the preserve. And then the last data story I'm going to tell is actually going to focus on animal communities because um, there's more to restoration than just plants. So my boss, Bill Kleiman, um, is actually was hired as the project director for Nechusa Grasslands in 1993. And in the early mid 90s, as he was getting into his role, um, it was still really new to do landscape level tall grass prairie restoration. And he wanted to be able to track progress. Um, was the work they were doing reaching the goals? Was it reestablishing native plant communities? Was it reestablishing what we call high quality plant communities that can include uh, rare species and species that were declining in the landscape? So in the mid 1990s, um, he came up with the idea to establish some permanent transects across the site. And he worked with some uh, leading botanists in the greater Chicago region. In the blue shirt, we have Jerry Wilhelm. And in the white shirt, we have Linda Masters. Um, and they're both uh, still active botanists um, in the region. They still come out to Nechusa regularly. 
And he worked with them to set up the transects and they actually started collecting those data in 1994 was the first year, 1996. And when I arrived in 2018, uh, this is what the preserve looks a lot uh, today. This was, I considered one of the higher priority data sets. Um, it was sitting around, it had been collected a little haphazardly over the years, but it had always gone back to these same transects. So I started digitizing that data and figuring out um, how we could analyze that and tell the Nachusa story through this plant community data. And uh, what I found were 12 transects that had been visited three or more times between 1994 and 2016. Um, and somewhat fortuitously, these 12 ended up being four transects established in what we would call remnant prairie habitat that had never been plowed. Four of those transects wound up in planted prairies where they had been corn fields and had been restored to prairie. And four of those wound up in what we would call savanna habitat. So these are areas that um, hadn't been plowed up for agricultural use, um, but they had been heavily encroached by uh, woodies. So there were some kind of big oaks and hickories in the mix, but a lot of dense honeysuckle and understory brush had really grown up and choked out um, the native understory community. So this are kind of the four primary types of habitat on the site. You can see here these these are identifying the numbers for each of these transects. Um, and their locations reflect um, the original size of niches and the original land purchase was down here. And these areas were early purchases in that uh, project. And you can see today we've added a lot of land uh, beyond these. Uh, in these habitats, we have done active restoration work. The native prairie remnants had High quality plant communities already present. In those cases, we've reinstituted prescribed fire. They get burned regularly. The remnants are burned about every three to four years. Um, we have done some uh, removals. Most of these were grazed. Some of them did have a little bit of eastern mid cedar or some honeysuckle in them. We may have pulled that out. But generally, we've just brought fire back and let these remnant habitats um, persist. In our savanna habitats where things were heavily overgrown uh, to the point that you couldn't even walk through it, uh, we have done mechanical and uh, chemical herbicide control to help clear out that woody underbrush and open up things underneath. We have added seed to these sites as necessary to help reestablish that um, community, uh, that understory community as well. And then of course our planted prairies where we start with the cornfield, usually a month or so after the corn crop goes out, um, we put the seed in these cedars. Here we have our pickup trucks um, headed through. This is the 2019 planting. Nathaniel is not driving one of those trucks, but he might have been. <laughs> you guys had already uh, taken Nathaniel away from us. Nathaniel was one of our crew leaders um, for a long time. And so uh, these plantings are you know, more highly constructed and we do a lot more work to aggressively control invasive species, um, particularly herbaceous invasive species. So in our plantings, we will go out with backpack sprayers and herbicide and intentionally uh, try to stay on top of things like sweet clover, bird's foot trefoil, um, what am I gonna say, Pars wild parsnip, um, a variety of kind of invasive annoying species. And, and we don't go after every non-native species because a lot of those non-natives won't become problematic. We really just focus on the ones that, that tend to outcompete the native species. Uh, we don't do that aggressive uh, approach for non-natives in the remnants in order to protect that, that special habitat. Um, one of the key metrics that managers at Nechusa Grasslands have been really interested in is understanding not just which plant species are there, but how representative they are of the tall grass prairie habitat in Northern Illinois that we're trying to recreate. So how many people in this room have heard of something called a coefficient of conservatism for plants? Okay, great. I wasn't sure uh, where this audience would land with this. Um, so I'll just be real brief. It's just a way for us to measure um, plant rarity or the affinity of that plant for a high quality, high quality native habitat. Um, and so I'm going to be using uh, the mean coefficient of conservatism as a value in some of these upcoming graphs. Just like to make sure my audience knows what that means. 
So the key questions that I was uh, looking to answer with this work are one, are management practices sustaining plant diversity, including rare plants and native prairies and savannas at Nechisa grasslands? And secondly, do restored prairies where we've planted them support comparable levels of plant diversity and conservatism to native prairies? So diving into the data, these are the native prairie transects. We have four replicate transects on different uh, native prairie remnants on the site. Each transect is a different color. And then you can see over time, the bolder color is the earliest sampling, I think in this case, 1994 for all of these. And the lighter, more faded color is the more recent sampling. I think these are 2011 to 2015 were the most recent samplings for these native prairies. And the big take home here is our native prairies are really different from each other. They're really distinct communities. Um, and that's part of why they were protected is that they were distinct communities. Uh, they don't necessarily look like each other. And they have all changed over time uh, with management at Nishisa. And you'll see that, that the way they've shifted over time in terms of this non-metric multidimensional space is not exactly the same. So if we kind of dig in to see what that might look like, on the top line here, we have total plant species, species richness. Um, we have one uh, statistical increase for this transect P19 over time. The middle line looks at the proportion of native species, because of course, total plant species richness could go up and you're actually looking at an invaded field with a lot of non-native plants. We saw no changes statistically with the proportion of native species in these remnant habitats. And you'll notice that this proportion is pretty high. It's between 80 and 100% for almost all of these remnants. So they're sustaining that native plant community. And then down here, we have that mean coefficient of conservatism. And we do see one transect where we saw an increase in that mean C value. The other transects have, have more or less held their own. Um, it's been up and down a little bit. Uh, they're being more or less consistent. When we look at the savannas, um, again, we have our four replicate transects across the site um, and across time. The savannas are a little bit different from each other. They're not quite as distinct as those native prairie remnants were, um, but they are also changing over time with management. And again, those shifts in that community were a little bit different on those different transects. And to dig into that, um, this is actually, I, I, I get excited. This is a graph with like, nominally no results, but uh, we had no statistical change in any of these plant variables. Total species richness, proportion of native species, mean C. They all have been about the same for 20 years. Um, what's interesting here is um, looking at the landscape because I work on the landscape every day, and, like these areas do look different. So I did some indicator species analysis to try and understand what might be happening underneath these numbers. And in fact, what we found with indicator species analyses is that the early time points for these transects and savannas, the indicator plant species were things like honeysuckle, poison ivy, Virginia creeper. And the more recent time uh, sampling points here, 2013, 2015 samplings, the indicator species were things like common native goldenrods, Joe pieweed, and some of our more common woodland sedges. And so, while the total number of species and actually the proportion of native species has remained more or less the same, we have seen, I guess you might say a functional shift from a woody encroached understory to a more open herbaceous understory. Um, but in terms of those big picture metrics of diversity, uh, there, it, what we're seeing is a substitution, not an addition or, or a subtraction necessarily, just a substitution. So looking at the planted prairies where we actively planted cornfields, um, this one I needed three dimensions in that non-metric multidimensional scaling to get at this. So I, I kind of had to break these apart. This is just looking at your, like you have a glass tube with a flower and you look at it from three different directions and you can kind of approximate what that flower looks like, but it looks a little different depending on which direction you're looking at. The take home message here is the same. There's some variation between these plantings. They have a little distinctness in and of themselves. They're more similar to each other than the uh, remnants or the savannas. And they have been shifting over time as well. And when we dig into our metrics, um, total plant species richness hasn't changed. Um, 
we do see an increase in the proportion of native species in the oldest planting on the site. P31 is the 1987 planting done in Nichista. And the mean coefficient of conservatism has increased in that 87 planting and the next oldest planting, the 1988 planting. Um, it's remained constant in these other two plantings. Um, so that was really interesting to see. And to get at the other question, um, are these native, do these planted prairies look like the native prairies? I put all the prairies, the natives and the planted together in the same ordination. And again, I needed three dimensions here. The native prairies are all in these warm colors, the reds and yellows. The planted prairies are in the cool colors, the blue. And so you can see there's some distinction. Um, the native prairies are grouping out differently from those cool planted prairies. And in fact, the Adonis uh, multivariate statistics support that those are two different groupings of communities. And when we look at our metrics, these are the same graphs you've already seen. But what I'm doing is I'm showing you the native prairie, the levels compared to the planted prairie. So total plant species richness is actually pretty similar. But when we start looking at the proportion of native species, that is higher in the remnants than it is in the planted prairie. Although, you know, our planted prairies are still 75% native cover on average, which is, I think, pretty decent. Um, and then our mean coefficient of conservatism, we see that distinction um, more dramatically. Um, and this is exactly what that metric is supposed to show. Our remnants are, of course, holding those rare plants that have a high affinity for undisturbed habitat. Our planted prairies are recruiting native species, um, but they're not necessarily you know, supporting that exact same community. So to come back and answer our questions, um, our management practices sustaining plant diversity, including rare plants and native plant um, prairies and savannas. I'm just realizing that you've got the little box there. Um, answer is yes. Um, we're seeing our remnant prairies are sustaining their distinctive communities. Um, savannas are doing really well. Management's working. Do restored prairies support comparable levels of plant diversity to native prairies? The answer there is not quite. The native prairies are still re uh, retaining a distinct plant community. And this is important. Um, this gives us kind of two important take home messages. One is that. Um, Restoration efforts um, are you know, keeping native systems uh, in a good condition. They are improving native habitat through restorations, but those restorations aren't necessarily a replacement for high quality native habitat. And uh, in the conservation world, we need to prioritize conserving those high quality habitats where they do persist. And in a state like Illinois, there's not many of them. Uh, and using restoration as a way to expand that natural foothold and bring more biodiversity and ecosystem services to the landscape, but to recognize it's not a direct replacement. My second uh, data component is looking at monitoring the impacts of bison reintroduction on plant communities. All of the data I've talked about so far predates the bison reintroduction at Nechusa grasslands. Uh, and when the decision was made to bring bison uh, back to Nechusa, there were a lot of questions around um, how do we monitor this change? How do we actually understand how the bison are impacting the system? So bison were reintroduced to Nechusa grasslands in 2014, and that decision was made with a lot of careful thought and informed from a lot of previous scientific study, including a lot of work that's come out of uh, Kansas, about the keystone role that bison play in tall grass prairie and how their grazing and wallowing behaviors can increase habitat heterogeneity and can increase plant diversity. And part of the goal here was uh, to really leverage the bison as much as a management tool um, as much as a conservation goal in and of itself. And so the bison grazing and wallowing and being on the landscape are creating that kind of natural disturbance that tall grass prairie evolved with in a way that we as land managers could never recreate, um, at least not in a timely or efficient way. Now, uh, this was approached with the question of how will bison grazing uh, impact plant communities? Uh, the hypothesis being that it would increase plant diversity by suppressing dominant grasses, 
reflecting some of the previous published work um, from Kanza Curry and other places um, that have had glycemic reduction. An alternative to that hypothesis, which some people raised, was that it might decrease plant diversity by grazing and disturbance, that it would be not a good thing for diversity. And then, of course, um, there's a null hypothesis. There'd be no change in, in the community. So Sarah Baer actually played a key role in uh, thinking about how to monitor and document this bison uh, impact and measure it on the landscape. She and Dr. John Taft, who's uh, now retired, but um, botanist with the Illinois Natural History Survey, worked with my colleagues, Bill and Cody, to think about how to monitor this change and also in a way that it could um, integrate with other data collected in the broader science. World. And so working together, uh, they came up with this plan that included 22 bison exposures. So these are fenced areas placed across the preserve where plant community data is monitored inside the fence and outside the fence. And you can see this again reflects kind of the habitat types. Um, our remnant prairies are the blue dots. Uh, these savannas are the yellow dots. Um, we actually looked at what well, collectively as a group, the older plantings. Uh, so that includes the plantings from the 1980s and 1990s in green. The newer plantings, these would be plantings done more or less since 2000 and in more recent times in green. And then a few wetland sites because we do have a little bit of wetland habitat in that one area. And in 2019, I was able to bring master student Jen Chakraborty um, out for a summer fellowship at Nechisa. Um, I've been doing this every year where I pay a graduate student's summer salary. That student works with me on some Nechusa data, but also uh, works on their graduate uh, project as well. And so Jen collected data in 2019 and 2020 on these exposures, and then she synthesized the 2015 to 2020 data to look at the first five years of bison grazing. So these are the exposures. They're fenced areas. We have a solar charge um, on them that sends some electricity through them. The bison are actually pretty good at respecting these fences. Uh, in the winter, we usually get a few fences that go down that we have to fix, but so it goes. And there's three parallel transects inside the fence and outside the fence. So in the presence of grazing, outside the fence, no grazing, inside. Uh, we do species composition and estimate cover in half meter quadrats along those three parallel transects. Um, and we have data from pre-bison before the bison were reintroduced, three years post-bison and five years post-bison. And what Jen found looking at uh, Sh uh, Shannon Wiener diversity, um, no changes in overall plant diversity. Um, in any of these uh, areas with grazed and ungrazed. Uh, she looked at the proportion of native to non-native species, um, and there were some trends in the plantings. These are our newer and our older prairie plantings. The grazed did seem to have a higher non-native to native uh, ratio. This is not statistically significant. These are just trends. And these patterns held up in the pre-bison data as well as the post-bison data. So there's a little underlying um, difference that's still there, but something that we want to keep an eye on over time. And then looking at the grass and forb treatment only in the savannas, again, she detected a trend, not statistically significant, but slightly higher grass to forb ratio in the grazed versus ungrazed plots. And again, um, some the pre-bison data seem to uh, support that trend as well. So again, something we're keeping an eye on over the long term. Looking at the total plant community structure, um, she did this ordination and we see our wetland communities look really different from our grassland communities, no surprise there. Uh, we have here our savannas in blue, the remnants in green. These are our plantings in yellow and red. Um, so again, you can see that there's distinct plant communities between these habitat types, and that's really the take home story of this, of this uh, graph. There was some change over the years. There was no difference between grazed and ungrazed in terms of overall plant community composition um, for any of these habitats. Uh, so the take home here being that, um, figure out, I feel bad that <laughs> these uh, coming out over top of that. Bison grazing um, has 
had little or no impact on plant community in the first five years that we've been monitoring it. Um, and if we come back to our initial hypotheses, this at moment supports our null hypothesis. We've seen no change in plant diversity. Now, this is just the first five years of data. We're looking forward to continuing to collect these data and monitor these uh, trends and patterns over the long term. And I'm working with Jen and her advisor, John Harrington from the University of Wisconsin, to publish these data. Now, Holly Jones put together this nice analysis that does kind of compare and contrast the response we're observing, at least initially at Nichisa, compared with the uh, pre-published, with the data that Kanza Perry has published. Um, and Kanza saw an increase in uh, the Shannon's diversity with grazing almost immediately in their uh, project. And we have not seen that trend at Nichisa. Um, and Holly did this analysis and these data don't actually come from Disclosures, so there's a little apple orangey here. And at Kanza, over time, the distinction between grazed and ungrazed has become even more apparent. So we're intrigued. Um, we're hoping someday we'll have 20, 25 years of data as well to see if any patterns emerge. I will note the starting diversity level for Nichisa is higher than it was at Kanza Prairie. And so that may be a contributing factor. We're working with a different baseline of plant diversity. We're also, we get a lot more moisture uh, than you all out here. That can certainly play a role as well. Um, and so there's many factors that may be influencing that. And of course, we're working primarily on restored prairie that was planted in the past 30 years. Um, and this is essentially all um, previously, you know, potentially grazed, but not plowed uh, habitat. So it's a different kind of um, site history as well. So I bring this up just to say we're learning a lot and it's um, interesting to put this in the broader context of the scientific literature and see uh, how that all contributes. So my last data story, uh, because not everybody realizes plants are so important, <laughs> uh, was to talk a little bit about restoring animal communities. Um, and this is a project that uh, has been really exciting to see different kinds of biological data come together to look at ecosystem restoration from a broader perspective. And this is work that was led by Pete Gidden, who I mentioned at the beginning. He was a postdoc at the time working with Holly Jones at Northern Illinois University. Holly Jones and Nick Barber, who's now at San Diego State, have collaboratively been collecting data at Nechusa since 2012. Uh, knowing that bison were gonna be reintroduced, they wanted to collect baseline data and document the change with bison, and they took more of a before-after controlled experimental approach for these um, data. And they uh, published last year a study that really pulls together a lot of the data they've been collecting over time. And they wanted to look specifically at how plant community diversity affects animal community restoration and how the management activities we're doing on the landscape influence the animal community. So for management activities, they are defining that as the age of planting. So how old or how long has that restoration been on the landscape? They're looking at prescribed fire, specifically the time since the last fire. All of our units at Nechusa get regular prescribed fire. Um, our plantings, it's usually every two, uh, two to three years. The remnants is a little longer. Um, so they're looking at time since the last fire. And then bison grazing as uh, this new management that has come in uh, since 2014. And they set up to ask uh, a couple of questions. Um, how does prairie restoration affect animal biodiversity? And they looked at both taxonomic and phylogenetic diversity. So they looked at diversity through those two different lenses. And is animal biodiversity shaped by the management uh, actions or the plant communities. And they set that up as a uh, field of dreams hypothesis. If you build a diverse plant community, will the animals filter in? Um, and the plant community, they were able to look at through the taxonomic, phylogenetic, and functional diversity lenses. So they used some structural equation modeling uh, to test the direct effects of management on animal biodiversity. And then the direct effects of plant biodiversity taking into account indirect effects of management on plant biodiversity. And they looked at uh, five distinct community 
So they collected plant community data. They did small mammal trapping to look at small mammal communities. Snake cover boards to look at snake diversity. Um, and invertebrate pitfall traps where they focused on ground beetles and dung beetles. So all in all, uh, their samplings, they looked at 278 different species from five different kind of biological categories and put that all together to look at restoration from this much broader scale. So yeah, I already talked about structural creation modeling, great. Uh, I will, this is Pete's study. So if you have detailed questions, I'm happy to put you in contact with Pete. <laughs> Uh, so first, looking at the effects of plant diversity, uh, there were effects. Um, age of restoration impacted all three of these diversity metrics, taxonomic, phylogenetic, and functional. Uh, red means it's a negative correlation. Green, or I guess the black circle, is a positive correlation. And these different plant diversity metrics did influence animal taxonomic diversity. Um, in some cases, positively for snakes and small mammals, over here for functional diversity, sometimes negatively, um, as we see for phylogenetic diversity. When they added the direct effects of management on these animal community diversity, they found that age of restoration had a pretty strong direct effect on animal taxonomic diversity. This was particularly true for these uh, invertebrate, the ground beetle, dung beetle community. Fire, times of fire also played a big role, particularly for the small mammals. Uh, it turns out white-footed mice and prairie voles, um, prairie voles really like a thatch layer. They don't do well in open areas. So after a fire, they leave the area, the white-footed mice move in. Um, but over time, as that thatch layer builds up, the voles actually outcompete the mice. So they just kind of chase each other around their burn units. Uh, bison grazing had very little impact, um, a little bit on the dung beetles, which makes sense. This was a large input of dung on the landscape. They also looked at animal phylogenetic diversity. Again, big direct effect of age, planting age. Uh, some effects of plant diversity, a little bit of bison on those um, uh, dung beetles. And when uh, you kind of sum up all of those paths and their relative strengths, uh, the management dire uh, direct management driven pathways uh, were about six times stronger than the plant driven uh, pathways. Although you note that there's a difference in how many pathways for those two categories. So to answer their questions, um, Management had both positive and negative effects on animal communities. And we saw that trade off with the small mammals, uh, with the dung beetles and the ground beetles. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, when you're managing at an ecosystem scale, there's certain activities that are going to help some communities and other activities that are going to decrease other. And by creating uh, a landscape where those activities are happening at different times and different spaces, you can create a landscape scale heterogeneity that benefits a broader diversity. And then secondly, is animal biodiversity shaped by management or plant communities? Um, I think the take home message here is management practices and plant biodiversity both influence uh, these animal communities, but management was a stronger driver than they had hypothesized. So at Nuchusa Grassland, the work continues. Um, we are continuing long-term plant monitoring on these transects that I talked about and we're added transects to include some of our younger plantings, some of our more recent plantings. Over time, our restoration approaches have also changed as we've learned more, and our younger plantings tend to have uh, a greater diversity of plants uh, in the seed mixture. They have a lower proportion of grass seed, um, and so we're just now starting to get enough repeated data from some of these younger plantings that I'm hoping in the next few years uh, we can begin to look at uh, those trends and compare with the older plantings uh, as well as these remnants and savannas. In terms of reintroducing bison in the past five years, we haven't seen much of an impact actually in terms of these data, and we're excited to continue collecting and seeing if patterns emerge after five years uh, with bison on the landscape. And we're continuing uh, to do restoration work. We plant new plantings every year and uh, continue to acquire property when those opportunities are there. So uh, it's a cool place to work and uh, lots of new things happening all the time. 
And science at Nechusa has really been taking off in recent years. Um, last year in 2021, we had 40 different researchers from 16 different institutions uh, conducting research at Nechusa Grasslands. Um, the project has produced, um, it's actually now 64 peer reviewed publications. We've had a few come out in 2020. I didn't update the slide. 14 of those came out in 2021. So we've really seen this research take off and the products from that research take off. We have an annual science symposium. This year it's gonna be virtual on April 23rd. If anyone's interested, you're more than welcome to join us. I can uh, get you the information um, where our researchers get to showcase uh, the work they're doing and learn about each other and collaborate. And um, we have an additional nonprofit group, the Friends of Nechusa Grasslands, uh, who works with the Nature Conservancy to support our mission at uh, Nechusa Grasslands. And they have a competitive uh, science grant um, program. And in 2022, for this year, they awarded over $66,000 across 13 different researchers. Um, and Reb has received funding from Friends of Nechusa for uh, work uh, that they are doing um, at Nechusa. If anyone's interested in learning more about Nechusa, I'd love to connect. Uh, we're always welcoming more researchers, new expertise, um, new ways to think about our ecosystem and our questions. And my role is to help connect more researchers with Nechusa and to help share the work at Nechusa across the scientific community. So with that, I will quit talking and open the floor for questions. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, let's right. keep an eye on the chat. I yeah. do not have a computer. All right, I'm gonna try this. Let's see if this works. Oh, yeah. I was just curious, you're just exposed to the alcohol on the hilltop, which makes sense. Um, is that part of the reason why the historian in them is really quickly just continues to poverty? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely a contributing factor and that our remnants are all on high, dry, sandy soils. And we don't have a lot of sandy soils in Illinois, but we have a lot of them in, at Nechusa. <laughs> and our lowland, our restorations tend to be lowland row crop ag fields. So that is absolutely a contributing factor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a question about the Nechusa Yeah. All right. So the question I'm realizing for viewers online was, um, how did we think about where we placed the bison, how we moved them, how they interacted with the landscape, and that's and how long they were grazing. How long yeah. they were grazing. So that's a really good question. Um, we took the approach to um, the bison have access to 1,500 acres of the preserve, and we don't actually move them around or sub fence them. They have full access to that 1500 acres and they choose where they want to go and where they want to graze. We burn, um, I guess, patchily, but not in a super regimented way across that landscape. So the, the bison area always has some burned habitat, recently burned habitat, and some area that you know, hasn't been recently burned. And the bison do graze more heavily on that recently burned area. And, you know, by kind of, we let the bison move themselves around, so we don't force them around, um, but we do see that they choose to use different areas, and it changes from year to year. So we'll notice that when I came in 2018, there was one area where we had an exposure, you could really see uh, a grazing lawn around the exposure and tall grasses in the exposure. And then the next year, you really couldn't tell the difference, but there was a different exposure where you could tell the difference. And so their grazing lawns are naturally moving the landscape. Um, so long story short, we didn't actually make decisions about <laughs> where to put them. Um, we've let them make those choices. I guess we did actively make a decision not to do a, a more controlled patch burn grazing where you would move the herd around more intensely. Uh, we let the animals decide what they want. Yeah, yeah. Oh, question in the chat. Okay, then I'll come back. Um, Oh, is there an eddy covariance tower at this grassland? That's a really great question. There is not, uh, but I'd love to talk about that <laughs> if anyone's interested in helping make that happen. 
Yeah, Jim had a question. So, um, what we have, yes, in the sense that what we've seen is where we get these grazing lawns, um, we don't have these dense cover of grasses. And in fact, the fire will not carry through. So we just, just last week, we burned a 400 acre unit in the bison unit. And um, my colleagues were like, well, pre-bison, this used to be a hot burn and it was black every year. And it was like kind of a little challenging to control. And with bison grazing, it's, uh, it's very patchy. Actually, someone's flying a drone, hopefully today, to quantify how patchy this burn was. Uh, but it, you could tell the areas where the bison had grazed, no black. The fire would not carry through. There was no kind of that grass patch layer to, to carry it. Uh, you get a lot of like stiff goldenrod stems individually, uh, <laughs> but you don't get that dense carry through. So they are uh, pulling that down. Um, Holly Jones lab did do some diet analysis using stable isotopes in the bison hair. And what was interesting about that is uh, about a third of their diet was warm season grasses, a third of their diet was cool season grasses, and a third of their diet was forbs. Um, and so, but it seemed the time of the year mattered. So in spring and summer, they're eating a lot of that warm season grass when it's young and growing as that starts to mature and gets real um, I don't know, cured and tough later in the season. They're um, switching to, I guess, a mixture of legumes and forbs and cool season grasses. And in the winter, it's really a cool season signature. We think they're actually probably eating a lot of sedges that stay green all winter under that snow layer. And those tend to persist in the wetlands and some of the woodlands. So that's our hypothesis. We've not been able to like pull out species or anything, but um, anyway, that was probably a long-winded answer to your question, but yeah. Yeah. This is also for attention. So, uh, you, you know, you're talking about how it compares to contrast. And the element that's distinct, right? Uh, most of us are seeing. Yes. So, when I was looking at the SEM that you made at the end, what's so interesting is that there's almost there's no support for paths from bison or fire to vegetation, which is like kind of a take home message. Do you have like any thoughts about, I mean, you have some thoughts about the bison side, yeah. any thoughts about the Fire side on how fire is not affecting diversity, phylogenetic diversity, functional diversity. Yeah, that's a really great question. So for the viewers um, online, the question was: um, if you look at that kind of last structural equation modeling, um, there were these effects on animal diversity from age and fire. None of those were influencing. Uh, or bison and fire were not directly influencing plant diversity in those models. And so the question was: how does that um, those were kind of the take home messages from Kanza work, what, what's going on here. So I have a few thoughts. One is we burn a lot at Nechusa and we don't burn in a regimented uh, experimental approach the way they do at Kanza. So all of our areas see fire every two to three years, honestly. And so I think from a plant perspective, you're not seeing changes because the plant communities are responding to a similar kind of fire regime, so to speak. And in this work, they used time since fire as it influenced animals, but the time since fire was never more than maybe 24 months. So I think that's why we're not seeing a lot of fire impacts is because we just, we burn a lot and we don't have those longer intervals that Kanza's experiment initially or intentionally set up. Um, and part of that's because we're really managing in response to, we're managers managing in response to what we see on the landscape and not um, experimental scientists keeping a regimented um, controlled experiment. Um, the other, all right, bison grazing. Yeah, and bison grazing, we haven't seen influences yet. Um, we may see them in a few years, it may take longer. Uh, my thoughts there kind of boil down to we, our starting plant community was pretty different. Um, we get, we just get so much more moisture. Like our plants, you don't, I guess, I don't know. I feel like in Kansas, you get a grazing and moisture, like double stress response. And in Illinois, you get a grazing pressure, but you've got so much moisture. Those, those plants really kind of respond from that grazing. All right, so I feel like that might contribute different landscape, different soil depths. 
those are my best guesses, but it's a really good question. Cause yeah, basically we look at our data, we're like, this doesn't match the scientific literature that we made these management decisions on. So we're kind of like, not sure what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sarah. Well, I guess I have a question and a comment related to that <laughs> is that, I mean, that your system is inherently more for me. The native prairies are more for me and your restorations are extremely for me. Mm -hmm. And there's some concern as to whether or not there was enough grass biomass to even sustain bison. Um, so I think that there, that is the inherent distance in the system, and, and it, part of the explanation for that is the precipitation, but it's also the inherent trend. And so what I think is really interesting about this is that when we were talking about introducing bison and coming up with that, uh, with the design, I remember in the background, there were stakeholders that were adamantly against these bison being moved into the landscape. Yep. And there are contingent of people who thought the bison are going to destroy this, these restorations. So I think it's great that you have no significant differences. <laughs> this is, I'm not going to lie. When I went to Illinois Natural History Survey, I'm like, look at this graph. We have no change in plant diversity. This is a great thing. Um, it, that message resonates differently at different audiences, but yeah, I agree too, Sarah, that audience. actually my big take Sometimes home from this work, play it up. exactly, <laughs> is like, I've never been happier to not have a significant difference yeah. in any of my results because it's showing that the system is withstanding the bison um, in a really strong way. Yeah, Sarah's absolutely right about that. I'll just recap if folks online didn't hear that. Um, the Nutrition Grassland system is inherently more forby. We have less grass um, than uh, what you would typically see out here in Kansas. Um, and around the decision to reintroduce bison, there was, um, we had colleagues and stakeholders who really were extremely hesitant and against that idea and that decision. Um, they really were afraid that bison were gonna destroy the habitat at Nutrition Grasslands. And so this science work and this emphasis of science really came out of saying, you know, we care about the system. We're not here to put bison on it to destroy it. We're here because we know bison are a keystone species to tall grass prairie, and we think that that's an important element to the system. And we can look at it on 1,500 acres out of 4,000 and collect the data and really understand that change. And so being able to bring this robust scientific data to our stakeholders and say, okay, here's a good look at what's happened in the first five years. And we're not losing our rare plants. We're not losing that diversity that so many, that really connects so many people to, to Nichiusa. And our bison are doing well. They're healthy, they're thriving. We do not feed them in the winter, actually. They, they uh, don't get any supplemental food. Uh, and so generally we're seeing the system is, is doing okay with the bison. So you're not calling them? We do call them. Uh, we do uh, transfer surplus bison. So we keep the herd at about 100 adults and then we get 20 to 30 calves each year. And we do a roundup in the fall, vet check to make sure everybody's healthy. And we do uh, transfer uh, extra animals to keep that herd size where it is. Yeah, yeah Jim. So I, I think that it's really exciting. There's so much about this. You think a lot about progress there. It is based on Wisconsin, which is an unusual and the composition is interesting. As you say, the forest, but the forest also above it. There's a lot more late dispensable forest in Illinois that that would behave differently with the fungus and interact with the environment. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you. That was a nice compliment. Um, I will say, you know, the diet analysis is the bison are using the forbs in part. Uh, we're a little curious, you know, we have plenty of like red clover, like running around in the project. We wonder the bison are, if they're like cows, they like the brome and they like the red clover. <laughs> like maybe it's actually not the native plants that they're most interested in, but um, uh, we'd love to dig in a little deeper. We do see them munching on things like rattlesnake master and spider wart. They love those. Uh, we've seen them eating milkweed of all things. They're like, I don't know why, but we've watched them eat them. Um, so there's not enough grass. <laughs> That's a good point, Sarah. <laughs>
<laughs> cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. We're going to stretch the limits of my animal knowledge here. Um, most of these animals, they're generally on the landscape. The thing that really popped when you really dig into that data, age was like the really big driver. And there is a little bit of conflation in that our oldest plantings are the ones closest to the remnants and adjacent to the remnants. So if you had like particular beetle communities or snakes that were holding on in those little hilltops, they would move into those first plantings first. And our younger plantings are just geographically further away. So there may be a little conflation there. Um, trying to think here, you know, I'm not quite sure how to, if prairie specialist is the right thing. In terms of snakes, like we get like, Eastern hognose snake, and we get some things that are not your just garter and run of the mill snakes that showed up in that data. Uh, beetles are, you know, there were a few beetles that were interesting, but most of those were pretty ubiquitous. But I think they they can kind of handle an ag field as in a prairie equally. Um, small mammals. Uh, you know, probably again, similar, most of those mice and voles are gonna be able to handle um, ag fields pretty well. The, the prairie voles really like that thatch layer and they don't get a thatch layer in the ag field. So we are supporting a great community of prairie voles and they probably don't, <laughs> they don't like our boundaries because they, they don't like a plowed cornfield, um, but they seem to do well in our preserves. So that's the best I can answer. Yeah. Yeah, we do burn in the wetlands. The wetlands are included usually in larger burn units. So we let the fire naturally go there. And usually they, if they're wet enough, the fire will go out and it won't carry. But we get plenty of big cattail areas and the fire will rip through those real hot and, and fast. Um, so we do burn in the wetland areas. Um, that seems part of the historic um, nature of that habitat. These are all, these are not big wetlands. These are, some of these are wetlands you can hop across. <laughs> Some of these are, they're a little bit bigger, but they're mostly areas where we've ripped out tile drain and we've just let the natural hydrology really equilibrate. And it's just like, yep, yeah, that, that became a wetland. So that's mostly what we're looking at there. All right, well, thank you, Elizabeth.